People go to court and they get a prison sentence. That's a very passive way of dealing with crime. When a person gets into restorative justice and they have to face the person they've harmed and they have to do things to repair the harm to the victim, we're actually holding them directly accountable instead of just putting them in prison for long periods of time and hoping that that'll deter them from committing crime again after they leave. Hello and welcome to See You in Court, the podcast that informs you about the Georgia civil justice system what it means to you, and how it protects individual rights. This podcast is a collaboration between the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Your hosts are Robin Frazier-Clark and Lester Tate, who are both past presidents of the State Bar of Georgia and currently serve on the board of directors of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. And now this episode of See You in Court. Good morning, friends and lovers of the law, and welcome to See You in Court. I am Robin Fraser-Clark, and with us today, as usual, is our co-host, the effervescent Lester Tate. Hey, Lester. Good, how, good, how are good, you? Good afternoon, Robin. You, you always afternoon. say good morning. You I know, do. And I, uh, you know, we just don't know <laughs> when somebody might tune this thing in, so I'll, I'll throw in a good afternoon uh, as well, but it's great to be back on a Another uh, taping of see you in court uh, yeah. as as we enter the, the the true holiday season. Before we went on the air, Robin and I were talking about every legal Christmas party. I think is tonight. So uh, it's, it's tonight's a big night. And by the way, I missed you at Lawyers Club bourbon tasting on Tuesday. That was a big night. Uh, big I crowd. Should, I should have integrated that into my trip and my other trip, but I was across the interstate at the Tech, Georgia Tech, uh, uh, University of Georgia uh, basketball game, the basketball version yeah. of plain old fashioned hate. Yeah. And I went with my uh, 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 college, one of my college roommates who uh, I also went to high school with and my best friend uh, from childhood uh, who went to the University of Georgia uh, and the, the two of them played basketball together in high school. So we've all, we all went together and, uh, it was, uh, it was an exciting game, uh, much more exciting for, uh, uh, the tech for our tech side than for the Georgia side. But, uh, you know, we, we do our fair of duty, our fair share of duty in Losersville with that series, uh, anyway, and some other sports. So it was fun nonetheless. Yeah, it was. Uh, I watched a little bit of that. It was a tight game the whole the whole way. I don't. I don't think any team got more than five points ahead. Yeah. You know, throughout the game, and it was uh, it was great. And we had the new Georgia Tech uh, football coach give us a little ha- halftime uh, uh, speech, which was great. Glad to see uh, that nice. Coach Brent Key Brent Key been, uh, retired. Right. And, uh, reti- rehi- re- retained, retired. Retired. I should say. To, yes. From the interim status to be in. The full full fledged coach this year. Well, I'm. Uh, I mean, I hate to brag, but the Georgia Bulldogs have just won the SEC championship, and uh, we will be in attendance on New Year's Eve at the Chick Fil A Bowl, and hopefully, we will beat Ohio State and return to the national championship. Is what we are hoping well, for. CU and court journalists have not yet got their Heisman voting privileges, but I'll tell <laughs> you, you know, if we get those, uh, Robin, I'm going to vote for Stetson Bennett for Me uh, too. for uh, the Heisman, uh, notwithstanding my uh, Georgia Tech uh, degree. Yeah, he is. He's phenomenal. Great story. He's got a great story. Well, today we are going to be talking with some very special about some very special work being done at the Georgia Justice Project. And and listeners may remember we've talked with uh, uh, Doug Amar, the executive director of the Georgia Justice Project before and had a wonderful conversation with him then. And we've invited Doug back. Uh, and then also we're going to have with us Rami El Garib, the program manager of the Georgia Justice Project's Restorative Justice Project. Uh, and and I'm going to tell you a little bit about both Doug and Rami. But first, I want to talk to you about Georgia Justice Project. If you'll remember, the Georgia Justice Project has sought to be advocates for individuals by providing holistic criminal defense and social services and by seeking systemic change in Georgia law that will reduce the number of people under correctional control and reduce barriers to reentry. Let me tell you a little bit about our guests. First is Doug 
Amar, Douglas B. Amar. He's the directive, executive director of Georgia Justice Project. Doug has been an active presence at Georgia Justice Project since its beginning in 1986. That's going back a long way, Doug. Starting as a volunteer, then joining as staff attorney in 1990, Doug led GJP as executive director since 1995. During his time as executive director, Georgia Justice Project has helped change 21 laws in Georgia that have worked to reduce barriers to reentry for people impacted by the criminal justice system. Originally from Charleston, West Virginia, Doug earned a bachelor's degree in history from Davidson College in 1984, and then a law degree from Washington and Lee University in 1989. Rami El Garib recently joined Georgia Justice Project as the organization's first restorative justice program manager. Rami comes to Georgia Justice Project as an accomplished restorative justice practitioner with several years of experience. In his current role, Rami supports Georgia Justice Project in efforts to build Georgia's first restorative justice program, taking referrals of felony cases involving adults or youth who are tried as adults. The program, Restorative Justice Georgia, is partnering, partnering with local district attorney offices in the metro Atlanta area. Before his role at GJP, Rami facilitated juvenile violent crime restorative conferences and victim offender dialogues in Colorado and Connecticut. He has also facilitated restorative justice processes for adults within the Colorado justice system. Additionally, Rami is the founder of the Restorative Rainbow Alliance, which aims to introduce a LGBTQ plus lens into the field of restorative justice by providing extra care for LGBTQ plus victims of hate crimes and assisting facilitators in understanding the extra levels of harm that LGBTQ plus individuals may face. Rami is also the founder of The Space, an LGBTQ plus youth safe space in Colorado that utilizes restorative circles to assess the needs of LGBTQ plus youth in the region. Originally from Lebanon, Rami received his undergraduate degree in psychology from the American University of Beirut in 2017 and his master's in industrial organizational psychology from the University of New Haven in 2020. Very impressive resumes. Doug and Rami, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It's great Perfect. to have you both. And 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 uh and Doug to have you back again uh because we had you once before. Uh, you were trying to get those uh journalist um, journalism uh bona fides to vote on the Heisman. I think you I can't believe you still have any after having me back again. I, I'm really <laughs> worried about that. Well, you, you know, let me just put it this way. I think you're our first repeat guest on See You in Court. <laughs> Let's make sure you're not the last. So <laughs> you, you can carry the weight of the world on your shoulders there today. Good point. And I, Doug, I'll just say I remember our conversation was so um, engaging and delightful. And we just essentially ran out of time. You could have told us more and more and more about the Georgia Justice Project. So we're glad to have you back. And, and now we're here really to talk about this new, exciting program at Georgia Justice Project, the Restorative Justice um program that rami is running uh rami we're, we're glad to have you on the show as well and we hope that this will get the word out about the new program that you have created and started at georgia justice project um we talked a little bit a long time ago when doug was on about restorative justice uh it may be a concept that a lot of our listeners are really not familiar with most of us know about the criminal law system, our criminal uh, judicial system, p crime and punishment. You commit a crime, you're caught, prosecuted and, and sent to prison, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Tell us a little bit about the concept of restorative justice. Yeah, thank you for that question, Robin. Um, sure. The term restorative justice is used a lot and a lot and loosely. So what it is, is a facilitated dialogue. It's victim centered. It brings in the person who was harmed, the victim or survivor, with the person who's harmed them into this facilitated dialogue to explore what harms occurred, specifically injustice and criminal behavior, um, if there's a crime, 
to explore what the responsible party can do to make it up to the victim and to explore the larger impact that this has had on the larger community. So um, it's a facilitated dialogue, victim-centered, voluntary. So this is not ordered or at least not recommended to be ordered by the courts or by a district attorney. So you tell know, us about the, tell us about the process. Like, how would you even begin with some somebody in a restorative justice program? So I would start by receiving a referral from either a district attorney or a court or uh, someone in the system. In for specifically our program, Restorative Justice Georgia, we would be receiving referrals from a district attorney's office, and in during. The district attorney will be speaking to victims and asking them if this is something that they want. So, as mentioned, voluntary, optional. If victims say yes to this, then they assess to see if the responsible party is taking some form of accountability. If they are, then they refer the case to me. I do an assessment with the responsible party to, again, assess for accountability, for accountability roadblocks, uh, what some of their needs may be. And then I also speak to victims on some trauma that they may have experienced from the crime, what they need. And so preparing each separately, and that may take a lot of time, so several different meetings. And then when I see that they're both ready, I bring them together. So I invite them to one meeting. And the conference or the dialogue is supposed to be a one-time meeting. It can take several hours, sometimes a full day, depending on the level of crime. And after that, either an agreement comes through and we work with the responsible party to successfully fulfill those agreements. Sometimes victims don't want agreements. They just want to express to the responsible party what's happened. So, yeah, that's that's how I usually go through the process. You know, Rami, uh, one of the things that I used to tell folks that when I became a lawyer, they said, what, what do lawyers do? And uh, as I after I practiced law a few years, I said, they help people get back like they were before they got like they are. You know, mm-hmm. you're <laughs> in jail, you want out, you're married, you want divorced, you're uh, sued, you want to be unsued. And listening to the goals of restorative justice, it sounds like that's sort of the exact goal is to try to help people sort of get back like they were before they got like they are to hit the reset button on that. Is that is that uh, am I view, viewing that through the wrong lens or is that accurate? No, I would say that's accurate because a lot of folks who do who are victims of crime sometimes don't know who the person who's harmed them is. So it's this big, scary figure and they become paranoid and it really affects their life. So after they do talk to the person who's harmed them, some of that trauma goes away and they do go back to what they were like before this crime and they can relax a lot more. So restorative justice does has, has, have a lot of benefits in terms of PTSD syndrome. So, yeah. What, what kind of, what, what kind of things do the perpetrators of crimes have to say in this? I mean, you know, obviously probably for it to have any chance of working, there needs to be some level of remorse or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, beyond that, what uh, uh, can you give me some examples of just the kinds of things that that come from the perpetrators? I think most people would intuitively feel like they know what the victims would say, like Mm -hmm. you you took my money, I couldn't pay my rent or you hurt me and I had to go to the hospital or whatever else. But I'm, I'm interested in what the. And, and also what that motivation is. I mean, is it to stay out of jail? Uh, you know, why, why do they want to participate in that? That's a great question. So I would say a couple of so responsible parties or defendants say a couple of different things. Um, I'd look for that remorse, as mentioned, willingness to not do it again, uh, being able to express what they think a victim may have gone through. So they may say, well, I think this person, I'm sure I impacted this person this way. So being able to try to relate and see how the other party has been impacted. And so these are all things that I look for and taking full accountability by saying I fully did X, Y, Z, and I want to know whatever I can do to repair this. 
And sometimes it's asking, they're asking me to ask the victims what the victim needs. Um, and that usually comes up during the conference. And I mean, there are people have different motivations. If someone's motivation is just to not be in prison then or jail, then I don't think it's necessarily the right process for them because this really has to be a genuine process if people think they can just come through the program and say the right things and get away with a felony then as a facilitator i would detect those and not move them through the process so usually a lot of times people do want to go through this because they feel a lot of guilt and remorse their families have been impacted by them so if someone commits a crime, their family also is deeply feels a deep sense of shame for the person they know that has committed that. So they want to make it up to their families who are indirect victims to the larger community. So there's a lot of different benefits to this as well. Uh, I'm wondering, do are there people who are victims of crime who think no way i i'm not gonna let this guy get off like that are you crazy <laughs> he needs to be in jail or he needs to be in prison you ever experienced that kind of reaction uh, yes so and that's something i do support you know this is voluntary and if a victim or survivor feels like restorative justice isn't the way for them or isn't the process or they're not happy with the legal outcomes that are agreed to with the district attorney and they want to prosecute someone then i would say you know go for that path if you feel that path is what will fulfill your needs as a victim um, but usually if there is some hesitancy and they do meet the person who has harmed them in the conference that feeling goes away because there is a human moment and it's a human process, not a legal process. So a lot of the times that hesitancy fades and especially when they get to ask the person who's harmed them, well, I need restitution. I need you to get clean. I need you to find a job. I need you to do community service. And they find that a more effective way than going to court and hiring lawyers and and all of that process. And Robin, if I could jump yeah. in, I think one thing sure. just to be clear is that we're the process doesn't presume, and the way we're setting up this process with this attorney's office, we, it doesn't presume that there will not be a conviction, and it doesn't presume that there will not be consequences when they go back to court. Now, as a defense lawyer, I mean, of course, uh, we hope to keep the number of folks who are convicted reduce that number. We hope to keep the, the reduce the number of folks who are entering the penal system, but it's not per se, uh, you know, a done deal that those are outcomes are going to happen because of a sort of process. Uh, and that was and this. And we can talk more about that. Mm -hmm. And this varies around the country about how um, restorative justice rolls out. But in our uh, at least our two MOUs that we have pretty much down, uh, th th there's not a preset outcome that says, this person will not be convicted and this person will not have other con or consequences enforced by the court. So I, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. like yeah, it's not, you're saying it's not a one or the other, at least for right now, it may be a hybrid of some criminal responsibility, jail time or, or rest, rest, restitution, something like that ordered by a judge, but then also a part restorative justice aspect as well. No. Not a get out of jail free card. That's right. I, no. I, yeah, that's, <laughs> I want to just put a, a pin in that just because uh, th th there are some programs we're familiar with a few in the country where if you go through a, a restorative justice practice, it means that there will be no conviction and no other consequence imposed by the system. But, uh, but honestly, those are often in lower level crimes. We are very specifically tar targeting felonies for adults, which are by definition, higher level than most of what's happening in the country in terms of restorative justice. And therefore, we're not, again, we're not, uh, that is not our intent. I mean, it is our hope, certainly, but it's not, we are not structuring this with a clear uh, uh, delimiters that there will be no conviction and no other sort of um, court-imposed sanction. In fact, those things will be determined whether there is a conviction or the, the outcome of the, and whether there's any other consequences outside of the agreement 
that will be negotiated before the person the persons enter into the RJ process. Is there any? Is there any? You know, there there are a ton of what uh, have rightly or wrongly been labeled as victimless crimes, but crimes against the the the, the peace, order, and dignity uh, of the state. Uh, is is that specifically excluded from restorative justice? And and if it's not, how does it? Uh, how how does it work when the when the victim is uh, uh, not an individual person? That's that's a great question. There's always, I mean, as a facilitator and as a restorative justice program manager, the easiest cases to do are ones where there's a clear victim who wants to participate. However, there are some situations where there are those victimless crimes, like if someone gets a DUI, for example, uh, and the case gets referred to restorative justice, that's happened to me in, in previous programs. Usually you look at themselves, you know, how have they harmed themselves, how they've harmed their family, their, their maybe spouse has to now take time off from work and pay all these court fees and their kids are stressed, for example, if if one of the two parents has to go to court because of DUI and has their license suspended. So you really need to look at the whole situation and see if there isn't a clear direct victim, maybe there's indirect victims around that can speak to harms. But isn't this also why we're training community volunteers to sit in the conferencing as well, right? It's, I mean, community, I mean, not the only reason, but it can be one of the ways you have sort of surrogates for the community to act as in those victimless crimes, there are people in the community that can sit as I'm part of this community. You harm the community by what you did, mm -hmm. and, and now that group of people, mm -hmm. which would could be a victim, I mean, victimless group, but people in the community where the harm happened, then get to decide what the consequence would be for that person. And, and, and is that how I mean? Right? I just want to yeah, I I would say so too. We do bring in community members, people who can maybe, for example, DUI if someone was a victim of uh, a drunk driver, for example, they can act as a community member, even though this is not the person who's harmed them, they can come and say, I have been harmed by substance use while driving, and this is how it's affected my life. So if you do continue through this path, this is what it can cost for others. And so you can really bring in members of the community, and you can shape it the way you want to based on, on the appropriateness of the situation. Doug, you mentioned, I think, uh, uh, earlier that you had a couple of uh, memorandums of understanding. You used the code word code M M O U, but I, I I picked up on that. I was listening. So tell us tell us about that. What are memorandums? <laughs> yeah, what what is that? What what's going on with that? Well, let me let me I, let me back up just one more step too, if I might. Uh, sure. I guess a point of privilege. So you know when we. I always like to say this is something that I've wanted to do for a, a long, long time. I, the, the the system I always felt needed this alternative. And I should also, a couple of things I want to say, we're not setting this up for our clients, for GGP clients, because in fact, we have a, we're still figuring out whether we can even send our clients through once these things get moving because of conflicts of interest, right? But that's another, we're setting this up for the system. And when we, um, you know, one of the folks I reached out to who agreed to be on our steering committee was the Prosecuting Attorneys Council and Pete Scandalakis. And, our, and we work with PAC, uh, the, uh, as they were known by PAC, uh, really through our policy work. And I know Pete pretty well. And we were on the phone a year ago, right around this time or so, a little over a year ago, around our policy agenda for the, the coming session. And, you know, and, and is the, we always have to talk to PAC when we're pushing or encouraging some kind of legislative fix around uh, criminal legal stuff. And so I said, and we had a few more minutes. I said, Pete, by the way, and we were about ready to start coming out of the water. We hadn't really told many people what we were doing. And I told him what we were trying to do and what we we're doing. And he got very excited. And what he said, what he told us on that, that phone call, you know, he was just very excited because he said, I have wanted to do, I've had victims who wanted a restorative opportunity, a restorative path. And there, and, and, and he was a DA for 25 years in, in, in West Georgia. 
Um, and he said there, there wasn't any path. I mean, I, I had to create something. There wasn't a path. So I, you know, in other words, he got frustrated as a prosecutor because there wasn't this ability to have a restorative engagement, even when victims asked for it. And as a defense lawyer for 30 some years, I saw the same thing. And so one of the reasons I think PAC agreed to put is agreeing to help us and participate as part of this effort is they they want more. You know, they know it's not it's not for everybody. It's not for every case. But there are a handful of cases where this is the right way to deal with it. And people want to deal with it that way, particularly victims and eventually those charged with the crime. So let me just say that. Our way of approaching this, first of all, we we did not want that's one piece. I just want to, you know, the prosecutors have felt the need for this uh, for years. The other piece I would say is the way we designed this is we did not want to sort of create a restorative justice program uh, and do a bunch of training and then hope that the system would take advantage of it. You know, knock as we heard from folks around the country, sort of, you know, create a program, train a bunch of people, and then knock on the courthouse doors and saying, "Hey, we have this opportunity. Why don't you take advantage of it?" I mean, because of because of my involvement and our involvement collectively in in the courts for years, we knew that. Well, our approach was we wanted to get prosecutors on board with how this would work for their jurisdiction, and so. Uh, because of that, we, almost right after I talked to Pete, the, we had, had lined up a couple of DAs we wanted to talk to. And our approach was to say, if if a, an elected DA, if they thought this was a need, just like Pete felt that they, that was that was missing in their community, that they would be supportive on on drafting a way for their office to send cases to this to this mechanism that that Rami is running, and um, and that's exactly what we've done. We we have uh, in fact we only wanted one prosecutor. Uh, we only but the word got out as getting out a little, uh, and so we were actually you know finishing two MOUs with two different uh, elected prosecutors' offices, and in conversations with about three more, uh, really four more actually. Um, but but the point is this is that we as a defense lawyer we know that the prosecutors have more to do with how a case moves or doesn't move, how it's resolved, how it's shaped. And uh, our thinking was we wanted, to, we wanted this to be for felonies, we wanted it to be for adults. Who controls that process are prosecutors, and they're the ones who can, if it lines up for them, it's appropriate fit, they're the ones who can uh, you know, steer a case, talk to a victim, talk to the defense lawyer, often the public defender, and 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 suggest this as an option. So let me let me stop there. I know I put a lot more on the table than you asked for, Robin. But does that does that make no, sense? Yeah, very very interesting. I noticed um, in what I was reading about the program that um, my DA and my good friend Sherry Boston from DeKalb County is one of the ones I think that you're working with now. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and. I know her very well. We're very good friends, but I would think of of all prosecutors, Sherry would be the most likely person to to be interested and and find a way to make this work in her office. She was the first prosecutor I called. <laughs> she's my DA too. I live right down the street from her. I live over in East Lake, and she's about four mm -hmm. blocks away. But I've known Sherry since she got out of law school. We've been friends for quite a while. But she's the kind of prosecutor that you're right that uh, that. And it turns out she was looking for this. And when I called her, she was so excited, almost like what Pete said. She was like, "This is exactly what we need. I, please, let's work together to make this happen." And she's the one who actually started telling other DAs about it and pulled in some other people. So, uh, we, so yes, I'm I'm very excited. We're very excited about working with Sherry in her office, um, and, and it's going. Uh, I'm very excited. I'll stop there. Yes. Have you have you moved out here into the hinterlands uh, where uh, uh, country lawyers like me practice? I should know exactly. Where, where is that? Bartow. Where's that? Bartow. 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 You know, we've had I haven't gone up to Bart. Uh, we know some prosecutors up there. Uh, it, I'll put it this way. No, we have not yet. We, <laughs> the first the second the second jurisdiction that we are we are finishing an MOU with is Douglas County. Um, and the Douglas County DA was a, you know, was a protege and good friend of Sherry Boston's, uh, Dahlia um, Racine. Uh, we work very closely with the Cobb County DA on expungement. We have the first expungement desk in the in the state in the Cobb County office. And so um, Flynn is, a, you know, we work with his office very closely and we are talking to them about whether this would be a good fit. And they we are second or third stage of that MOU with them. Um, and we've inadvertently, mainly because of our expungement work around the state, other DAs are hearing about what we're doing and asking us to bring RJ with us our, uh, as we show up. Like we're uh, we're negotiating with the Augusta DA and solicitor to put an expungement desk in that courthouse, as well as a few other courthouses in the state. So all I have to say is um, we want to, you know, I, I'm excited that there's traction. 
Uh, and we know that there's a need for this in other parts of the state, uh, but we want to get some momentum built here uh, before we totally start uh, making it available. However, I would say this, Lester, is that we, I mean, uh, Rami's not going to, we've talked about this a little bit. We can envision, you know, a few cases being referred without a, a, an onslaught from, from other places. So I think it could be available, but we probably just can't do it to scale a, until we, uh, in, in jurisdictions that are a bit further away. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons, you know, like Pete, I've known Pete, you know, for a long, long time, and uh, he, he's not an adjacent circuit, but one that's uh, similarly, uh, similarly uh, OTP, uh, uh, you know. And so I, I guess I'm asking if you have an OTP MOU or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I think that uh, uh, I, th I think it worked. I think it worked great, you know, in places like this. Uh, either, you know, I know your program, you're you're starting to move with it and everything else, but uh, restorative justice in general, uh, you know, one of the things in all, you know, all a criminal justice that particularly prosecutors and and, and I think the public and, and rightly so, they always want to know about recidivist rates. You know, if you if you if you if you put somebody through the penitentiary are they unlikely to do it again or are they more likely or if you. Oh, we gave you probation. You know, did 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 you get away with it? And then, you, you know, you're back. So are there any uh, statistics or any indications on uh, where restorative justice works, uh, especially when compared with uh, prison sentences? And the, the short answer is yes. And, and, and Rami's probably more up to speed on some of these studies. But for years, there, there have been studies on this that folks who, as a defendant, quote unquote, go through the system of, of an RJ process, they, they have a lower recidivism rate than than otherwise. But I'll, uh, and I know um, I've read about this for a good long time. Rami's much more up to speed on the current numbers than I am. Yeah, I would say it really depends on how people define recidivism. Is it over three years? Is it over a year? Is it over three months? So numbers vary in the field of restorative justice, but usually ranges around reduction in recidivism around 75% reduction or 75% uh, uh, reduction or 75% recidivism rate. Reci yes. Like people don't. don't get, oh, I see. Which is almost the exact inverse. Department of Justice nationally puts out a number they have for years and hasn't changed much, unfortunately, mm -hmm. that as folks go to prison in three years, 76% uh, ish go back to prison within three years. You get yeah, a so it's, it's the other way around. You get a starter sentence, and then later you get your your, your long uh, lifetime, decades long uh, sentence uh, after you've been been trained there. Well, there's, and I, you're, I mean, you're right to bring this up because there's. I'll say this too. I think the system, you know, of course, got to give a lot of credit to lots of folks, even like, of course, like Governor Deal, former Governor Deal, who did a lot to really turn the you know, the battleship of criminal justice in the state in a different direction. And one of those big mechanisms was really around accountability courts where uh, they do track drug courts, they do track recidivism rates. And they that has been proven around the country to be one of the ways of lowering. I mean, of course, you know, accountability courts often there is accountability. Folks get treatment and help. They often don't go to prison, but they often convicted or not, depending on how every little circuit works a little differently. But the point is, They've been tracking whether those folks get back in trouble again, and they are at a much lower rate than if they hadn't gone through an accountability court. So I think the system is looking for these ways to not, you know, to do the same thing over and over, keep sending people to jail and prison, probation and parole that has sort of often negative social outcomes, i.e. recidivism. You know, one, one of the one of the and I, I, I suspect Robin, I'd be interested in Robin's observation on this, but one of the things about accountability courts that uh that that i've noticed which makes me a big fan of them is the way uh the, the way the judges that are involved uh react to having an accountability court and the people who are in their accountability court you know it's almost like that uh the, the old joke about you know like the you, you always know who's doing crossfit because they tell you about it you know all the time <laughs> you know, so any judge that's got an accountability court wants to tell you all about their you know drug court mental health court veterans court you know what whatever else uh that 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 goes along which tells me you know a couple of things one they feel like they're just uh human uh that they're, they're just 
human rerouters, you know, rerouting, you know, this person goes to prison, this person goes to, that, uh, until they get involved in something that actually helps, sure. help, gives them a hands-on approach to try to change somebody's life. Yeah, I'm wondering if you guys have had any pushback since our DAs are elected in Georgia. Have you had any pushback where they're worried about how it would affect their elect reelection uh, chances? Like, oh, somebody's going to see me as being soft on crime, which is a big no no in the state of Georgia. Um, do you have any any response like that, or is it, uh, no? It's all been positive. It, well, we've been we 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 uh, maybe to Lester's earlier point, we haven't uh, been Johnny Appleseed with this yet either, and gone uh, to the entire state and asked for prosecutors to sign on. Um, but um, I would say actually, it's it's almost the opposite. There's a I mean, um, <laughs> a number of people have uh, prosecutors, whether DAs or solicitors, have run on a restorative justice, they use the term very loosely, or a redemptive sort of way of engaging the criminal system. You know, they're almost, they've been elected to do things differently. And for them, this is one more tool in their toolkit of being able to do things differently in their jurisdiction. And and I think many people in communities are used to the same old, same old that doesn't have an impact and, and whatever way you want to look at it, whether you think from a, from a defendant's perspective, from a victim's perspective. Uh, so I think, I mean, that's one of the, I guess I was trying to say, I think there's a thirst in the system, and I think it's been this way for a while, uh, for folks to bring alternatives, different ways that lead to better outcomes. Because we've been doing the, you know, that's what insanity is, right? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We've been doing that as a country on criminal justice for quite a long time. So uh, I think it's almost the opposite. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that we have not gone to... Um, you know, we have not uh, gone to try to convince a prosecutor that they need this in their jurisdiction. Maybe that will happen in a few years as we grow. Uh, that'll be a fun engagement. Uh, we and and one of the folks on our steering committee, the former Chief Justice Harold Melton, has sort of brought that up uh, as a way too that we, you know he wants to make sure that we don't stay in really just you know comfortable jurisdictions that we really start talking to folks outside um, that, that, that we can at least have those conversations. Yeah, and I would say. It's usually well received once people know what restorative justice really is. There's, I mean, people do say soft on crime and all of that, but it's actually not soft on crime at all. When people go to court and they get a prison sentence, that's a very passive way of dealing with crime. When a person gets into restorative justice and they have to face the person they've harmed and they have to do things to repair the harm to the victim, that's a we're actually holding them directly accountable instead of just putting them in prison for long periods of time and hoping that that'll deter them from committing crime again after they leave prisons. So I, um, I, I want to ask you all, you know, so the people who have these very progressive programs, uh, which I applaud, by the way, you know, and I, and, you know, I think it's great. Uh, always get asked to weigh in on uh how we could better implement punishment, rehabilitation, th those kinds of things. Uh, and I mean, I, I, y'all may not know this, but I've been a criminal defense lawyer uh, in, in, in some major portion of my practice for about 35 years. So I've you know, met a lot of people you know, accused of crimes and represented a lot of people accused of crimes, tried you know, everything from murders to DUIs you know, over the years. And but I'm I, I feel like we ask the wrong questions to people who have great insight like you all. And and so we've had like, you know, particularly in Atlanta, you know, they had a shooting over on 17th Street, you know, the other night. Uh, you know, gun crime is is pretty rampant, you know, everywhere. Uh, uh, what 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 do you see as measures we need to take, not for punishment or rehabilitation, but for crime prevention? Wow. Well, that's uh, um, that can go lots of ways. That's a big question. My, my, I thought you were going to ask a little different question, Lester, when you asked that. Um, well, you can answer. That's the great thing about it. it on the that's right. That's right. The witness stand. You well, can answer the question you want to. But well, I, I just think it's I think it's a question that we need folks who are in the business you two are in to help answer. So, so well, let me say one thing. I, I heard um, an interview a week or two ago with the, the newly, newly elected mayor of L.A. 
who uh, was asked about crime and punishment and, and police and how that she was going to. And I thought it was one of the better answers I've heard in a while where she said she accounts a lot of the rise in crime, you know, connected to COVID, connected to the, the cessation, if you will, of a lot of programs that intervened with youth, young people, giving them alternatives, whether they be whatever the alternatives are, those things just aren't haven't been operating sometimes at all, but certainly not on the level they were prior to the pandemic. Uh, and an example that we, we've we been uh, actually uh, been meeting with the, the Goodwill Industries in North Georgia about a partnership we might do together. And they were just in the office last week and they gave us a data point that was pretty interesting. They said that their programs, they went to virtual programming, of course, like everybody did. And there's been these studies and these guys are very metric driven, of course. And they said that the, the success rate on if it's a non- personal engagement in their work, and it's all workforce development and getting people ready for jobs. Obviously, obviously a lot of direct um, 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 impacted folks from the system. They said they have a 26% success rate nationally if they, if it's like through methods like this, like Zoom. But but when they're able to do everything they want to do and have done and proven to do in person, it's, it gets as high as like 96%. And so I think that the, the fall off in the, the fall off in these programs due to COVID uh, it, the, and due to schools not being around and, and after school programs and interventions is a big part of why we've seen a rise in crime. And, I, and again, I want to echo what the mayor of L.A. has talked about. But I think this idea that we can just continue everything like we had before and not be in person is just is just a fallacy with regard to efficacy. But having said that, uh, what, what I would say that this let me get a bit philosophical for a moment. I, you know, unless you made a really good point about judges being involved personally, I, I think I talk a lot. My team used to hear me talk about this a lot is that the criminal legal system is incredibly silent. I mean, incredibly silent. Um, you know, there, I mean, from the police to the D.A. to the to the judge, to the prison, to probation, to parole, to afterwards. The, most of those folks don't talk to each other and often deals with people off, would often say is in a fairly one dimensional way. You know, our criminal defense practice for 36 years is really I always I talk about it as, you know, our, uh, what we've been really trying to do is make our clients three dimensional in court for the D, for the judge and the D.A. is to deal with our clients individually in a three-dimensional way, but then have the system deal with them in a three-dimensional way, which is not the way they're used to dealing with. They're used to, you know, you did this crime, what's the punishment, now what do we do? So accountability courts have, have opened up, I always say, the aperture of how the system sees that person. It says, oh, we're not just seeing you as you broke the law now, or oh, you have a mental health issue, and maybe we should deal with that. Or oh, you have an addiction issue, or maybe you, how can we tie that to your, your uh, service to the country as a veteran? in terms of getting some help. So I think this idea of, of widening open the aperture of, of people with each other is, is honestly the way we're going to get past a lot of how we hurt each other. I mean, it's much it's much easier to hurt somebody or treat somebody in a dehumanizing way if I see them and treat them in a one dimensional way. And unfortunately, I think um, the criminal legal system is often set up to do that. So so even what we're talking about here, restorative justice, however big or small it might be, is, is one other manifestation of an open aperture of a three dimensional engagement, not between the lawyer and the client, between the client and the person they harmed or the community they, they live in. And, and those engagements are often not even one dimensional. I mean, I've been a defense lawyer for a long time and victims involvement is minuscule. In, in, in criminal cases. And so th to give them the power to say, this is what you did, this is how you affected me, and this is what it meant to me and my family or me and my community is a way of making every three-dimensional back to the to the defendant, quote unquote, right? To the person who did the harm. So I think I think you were on to something when you when you talked about like how we how the system is normally so narrow. And but more and more it's it not just accountability courts, what we're doing, or the sort of justice, and even the way we practice our defense work is really a, a defiance of that one dimensionality. And, and, and I really believe that's a way of, of changing. I've, I've, I've had two uh, pleas in the last year that I did as, you know, what we in criminal defense business call a blind plea. Oh, yeah. You know, and and uh, the reason I did both of those was because both of them were for crimes that the DA wanted somebody sent to the penitentiary, and I didn't think they ought to go to the penitentiary. And so we did a blind plea, which I think is very similar to what you're talking about in sort of opening up this. This is why this has happened. This is what this person's done, you know, since then to try to uh, 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 make sure that they've uh, made up for it and, uh, you know, paid back, done, you know, whatever. And in both those cases, the person you know, stayed out of custody, you know, because we kind of gave a, a, a little bit fuller picture. But I think the accountability courts 
really specialize in that, but I, I, I think all of us are just, you know, oh, you got a recommendation. Here's the recommendation. It's what the standard is. You know, we we roll with it. I yeah. would just like to add, um, so for our program, Restorative Justice Georgia, not all crimes are eligible to go through this program because this program acts as a alternative sentencing kind of program. Uh, cases of murder or other sexual assault, uh, domestic violence, do not will not go through this program restorative justice can happen to some of those cases however it isn't necessarily people do go to prison for those and stay in prison and there isn't any legal benefit to it it's just a facilitated dialogue that may happen in that prison if it's a case of murder for example and i've, I've seen that happen so just wanting to mention that our program is one way of doing restorative justice where it can be done in different ways as well. You know, I, I recently watched um, online victim impact statements in the mm -hmm. Parkland high school shooter down in Florida, that case where um, it, the case, the trial was what the it was a sentencing trial, life in prison without parole or death, death penalty. Uh, surprisingly to me, a Florida jury did not sentence him to death. They gave him life without parole. But even with that, the judge allowed all these uh, parents to come in and give victim impact statements. Um, it was some of the most gruesome, devastating statements you could ever imagine. All these people have lost their children. Um, but a couple of questions about that. Are victim impact statements part of restorative justice? Do do they do anything? Are they are they a good idea, a bad idea, or or do they matter? And um, and then Rami, we're going to talk about this because I want to play this little clip that we talked about. Is there does there have to be forgiveness involved? Because I'm going to tell you, these parents. They there was no forgiveness in their hearts. There may have been one or two, but most of them, no way were they forgiving this this shooter. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious your thought, thoughts about victim impact statements. And then this issue is is forgiveness included. Well, let me Rami is a, the best person to answer most of this. But let me just jump in. And, and it's um, and I we've all watched in the court system how there's been more empowerment of victims in this um, Marcy's Law and all these movements towards really trying to get the victims more engaged. But on, but my uh, and the victim impact statements are very familiar with um, uh, my my <laughs> just be honest, <laughs> I, I think I think those things are very anemic compared to a real restorative encounter because okay. it, it's it, it's again, it's a siloed, uh, you know, guard railed sort of mm -hmm. engagement that doesn't affect the outcome. Right. It's like, OK, now you get a chance to say something. You know, we you know, we've learned around the country and I won't name states, but we've learned a few places in the country where uh, the Department of Corrections has set up the ability for a victim and their family to come in and just sort of, I always say, just yell at the defendant who took away or did harm to their family and without any real engagement. Right. So those things are like they're, they're escape valves for pressure and tension um, and relief valves, but they are not restorative in the sense that they're giving a voice, but but not really altering the course and allowing uh, allowing people to see and be with each other and heal each other. And so I'm not against victim impact statements, but that is not restorative. Okay. Well, that's what I would say. No, Rami, good. This is good. We're going to get into it. <laughs> um, I would say I use victim impact statements when victims themselves don't want to be a part of the process, but they do want a restorative justice process to move forward. So they do write impact statements, and we have a victim surrogate read those impact statements on their behalf. I, you speak, you're talking about inside a restorative, inside a restorative process. process. Not, we, they're talking about in court. If we're talking about in, in court, court, yeah. I mean, yeah, in court for something to be restorative justice fully, you have to have both parties. I wouldn't call that necessarily restorative. Right. If I can be, I'm no, I'm jumping in here, but a little more. So you all, I, before we got online here today, I heard you all talking about mediation cases. Th think of it the same way. Well, you wouldn't come forward to a case and say, judge, we have a mediated re resolution. Let me tell you what my client wants. No, you you have mediated. You have met. You've already worked, worked it out. That. Right. That me, you coming to court and say, you know, we're using mediation practice as an ADR. I'm going to tell you exactly what my client wants. That's representing your client in court. That is not ADR, and that is not restorative justice. The corollary back to sort of an impact statement. 
Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think some of those victim impact statements, you know, the uh, I mean, the, at least as I understand it in principle, the victim impact statement is supposed to be how this crime has impacted me. And, you know, and, and, and look, I, I fully, you know, revenge is a real thing. And, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, bitterness, I can't I can't imagine the bitterness you would have at the loss of a child. Mm-hmm. So I'm not being critical of the feelings that like the the folks in Parkland had. But what I am saying is what they really want to, you know, a lot of what they had to say was about how I want to impact the person who, who did this to my kid. And, and again, I, I think that's, that's perfectly understandable, you know, to me, but it's, it's in a different category from what I think of as a victim impact statement. I want to, I'm sorry, Rami, go ahead. I just wanted to answer the second part of your yes. question, mm-hmm. the forgiveness part. Forgiveness yeah. is not uh, an expectation in restorative justice at all, because, and sometimes I do have defendants who start to want to ask for forgiveness in a restorative justice process, and I cut them off, because once you've taken something from someone, putting it back onto them and say, you have to forgive me, or can you forgive me, is not appropriate. So, it's too much. Yes, if a victim wants to forgive then that is their choice and if they want to offer that that is great but that's not an expectation this is a process for people to get answers to tell folks how they've been impacted to let out some of those emotions and triggers that they've had and and all of the trauma to to tell this person this is what you've done to me and this is what you've done to my life well i wanted to um play this clip of um an incredible moment in a in the criminal justice system and and just to give to set it up um this w- involved the um shooting uh, of a by a police officer of a man named Botham Jean and, and and the police officer was Amber Geiger and this was in Texas people may remember that uh the police officer Amber Geiger entered the wrong apartment she thought she was entering her apartment she entered both of Jean's apartment thinking someone and he's there in his own apartment eating ice cream. And she thinks uh, an intruder is in her apartment and she shoots him and kills him. Um, so the the what I'm going to play is a clip of his brother, Brant Jean. And I've given a little talk about different types of justice. I did it for for Lester when he was president of CBOTA. Southeastern American Board of Trial Advocates, we we did this. And this was a little clip I played, and I want to share it because I think it's incredibly moving. And then we'll talk about it on the on the other side. And I want to know what where, what is this? What are we listening to? Where does it fit in? Is it restorative justice? Does it do any good? Um, so let me play this clip. I don't want to think twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us I think you know that but I just I hope you go to God with all of it all the guilt, all the things, the bad things you may have done in the past, each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it again. I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family, but I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but 
I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. All right, there's our our clip, and it was to me very moving. Incredible. This is a young man who just lost his brother, who was, I would say, murdered, but shot and killed. Um, but some way being able to forgive his his the shooter um, and show incredible grace. They hug there at the end, which, you know, if you've been in any criminal trial, there's no hugging allowed by the defendant. I mean. I, I barely, I, I've done one murder trial and the judge barely let me touch my own client. But, but okay. after conviction, they had sheriffs all around. I, there was no hugging family members or anybody. Um, so that was unique. And I think the judge took a, a little bit of uh, grief about that. But maybe she did the right thing. What I'm going to ask both Rami and Doug, what is your reaction to that? I think it's powerful. I I think that that takes a lot of, uh, I don't really know what the word for it. It's, you know, the victim's families must, he must have a, you know, very big heart to forgive and, and do that. I wouldn't call that restorative justice uh, just because in a restorative justice process, you know, there's so many layers of preparing folks for it. And we don't know if the person's taking accountability uh, we don't know if you know there's just a lot of things that aren't said in that we didn't see at least during this clip um restorative justice process also don't usually take place in a courtroom they do take place outside where it's a neutral space for folks to be comfortable and be able to share and to explore harms so I would definitely say this is a great example of, of forgiveness, but uh, again, restorative justice, there's not, people sometimes don't find healing from restorative justice. You know, people go into the process and make of it what they want to make of it. So if they're there to find healing, then that's what they'll find. If they're not, and they just want to share, then that is the process for them. So just, it's a facilitated dialogue. I think from the clip that I did see, it looks like he's just forgiving the, the person so there's just a bit of a difference there i would say i think i think when when i saw this and i'm what it tells me is there's a massive appetite for restorative justice that you know, i agree with rami and everything he said it, what this says is that it, it really speaks to that idea that that here's a victim's family that is cut off from real engagement for what can and should happen or what they want to see happen and a human connection with the person who created the harm and what it said it just tells me that they're is an opportunity in the space to do restorative, to do more healing. I mean, and that's it's just like an aching. This guy's like aching to connect with a person who took somebody away from him. And the only way he has to do it is to be on the witness stand at a victim impact statement and to do what happened. So to me, it's like, it's like, you know, uh, exhibit one of need for these kinds of things that we are creating. It's like, 
because it's not there. It is not there. As so many prosecutors have told me, and those of you us who have been in courts for years, it's just not there. We are trying to fill the gap and so that there is a there and that opportunity can happen. So some engagement and some form of accountability that could lead to healing and could lead to forgiveness. Yeah, I've spoken to people. So I spoke to a mom who's her son was murdered by a friend of theirs, a family friend. And she wanted to do a restorative justice process. And I said to her, why do you want to do this? What what are you hoping for? And it wasn't forgiveness. It was, I heard my son's first words when I brought him into this world. And I wanted to hear his last words because she didn't know what his last words were. It was the, the friend who murdered him only knew those. So she was like, I want to know what that was like. I want to know, I want to be able to stop having nightmares of different scenarios or how my, of how my son was killed. I want to know how exactly it happened. So, um, it's different things come up. How, how, how do you handle security for this? And, and I mean that both in the physical security sense, but also in the sort of emotional security sense, because, you know, just like Robin was, uh, talking about the, Parkland parents. I mean, you know, there 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 are a lot of parents that would want to get the hands their hands around the neck of the person that killed their kid. Uh, but even if you're able to, you know, physically prevent that, there's still, it seems to me, some challenge involved in making everybody feel safe enough to really even be there, much less open up about it later on. Yeah, I would say in terms of making people feel safe, that's as a facilitator, my job to build some rapport with folks, just start by gaining their trust and allowing them to share. A lot of victims of crimes haven't shared their stories with a lot of people. So they usually come to me and and I'm the one of the few folks that they have shared the impacts of this with. And it takes a lot of time. Sometimes I do say, okay, you're not ready for this yet. Let's hold off on doing a process until you've processed some more, or I do process with them, you know, some more emotions. And then when they're, when I see that they're ready emotionally after several times of meetings, sometimes over a few months, then we can do this process. So it's really, based person to person and detecting are they talking about what happened to them in a way where they're breaking down still are they talking about it in a way of anger how do we move into a more restorative way of expressing those uh, feelings and emotions and needs so i would say it, it takes a lot of preparation and a lot of assessment before bringing the folks in and they have to trust me as a facilitator and I have to build that rapport with them as well. So that if they're in the process and they look to me and they're uncomfortable, I can stop the process or give a timeout. Um, in terms of physically, I would say people wouldn't go through restorative justice if they wanted to punish someone. I mean, if someone lays their hand on someone else, in restore, I mean, even if it's a restorative justice process and there's confidentiality, that's still a chargeable offense <laughs> if someone assaults someone else in a process. So I don't think people would, would go through this and want to, at least I haven't seen that happen. So where where is your restorative justice program now? Do you actually have folks who have gone through the program yet or are you still at the very beginning stages? We're at the very beginning stages. I mean, a couple of things have, are, have happened, uh, one of which we've already trained uh, about 15 or 20 volunteers uh, all together. Right, I forget. Eight, uh, how many volunteers have we trained? I should know. We have two paths for volunteering. One is a community member training, and we've trained about 21 of the community members. And we have seven fully trained facilitators. So that was, we, we started moving in that direction in October. We are, uh, we basically um, have agreements with both that are being signed off on by the DeKalb and Douglas County. And uh, the agreements, uh, we've come to terms with the DA's office now that's going through their, the civil, the attorney, the civil attorney side, the county attorneys just making sure, uh, dotting all the 
I's and crossing all the T's. Uh, both of those jurisdictions have told us that they are, are queuing up cases to send to us, that they've already identified cases and they've been waiting for those agreements to be finalized. Not uh, Now it's more of a bureaucratic uh, delay. It's not much of a delay, but that's the hold. Uh, so they are already identifying cases to send to us. Rami will be the, the person with uh, our team now of volunteer facilitators and uh, community members that will start handling those cases um, as soon as, I mean, we expect cases to start flowing any any day, maybe in the next week or so. Oh, great. Great. I noticed that y'all have um, maybe planning to um, to get introduce a bill in the 2023 legislature. I guess, is it centered around restorative justice and I don't know what you what kind of statute you would have to have for it, but um, yeah, so will you be you, down at the gold dome? Oh, oh yeah, oh we've already no oh, yeah. So as you know, I mean we've uh, as an organization for the last fifteen or so years we've done policy work and we have uh, changed now up to twenty two laws, twenty two different bills. Yes. Um, yes. And so this year we we're getting I guess we're getting more uh, um, aggressive. Well, usually we only have one thing. Uh, we are pushing three items this year legislatively. Um, and one of those three is a restorative justice bill that will, um, we don't, let me just be clear, the bill and what we're pushing for initially, we don't need it. It's not an empowering legislation because this process can happen through agreements of counties and courts and DAs and defense lawyers, which is the path we're going, of course. The bill is really to, as Rami alluded to a little bit, is to protect the conversations, to be have privileged conversations I mean, very similar to what happens in mediations or negotiations. So what happens in the, in the restorative justice processes will not be el uh, allowed to come into court later. And it's really as much to protect the facilitators so they don't become witnesses one way or the yeah. other. But really, it will allow a process to happen. And then uh, if, if things work out, and then you have an agreement and, and things you, know, you ex but to extract uh, further you know penalties or other charges that's just not uh in keeping a handful of states have passed laws like this and we modeled i believe our bill primarily on illinois which just passed a bill like this this, this year um so it's not a we believe i always say this but it's, it's not a heavy lift uh we don't think uh because it's really an evidentiary code it's, a, it's an evidentiary code matter in title 24 it's not a, it, it, and uh, it's just a matter of protecting the participants so they don't are called into court for other reasons. Yeah, makes sense. And may give, if you have confidentiality, may allow people to open up a, a little bit more if they know it can't be used against them. Exactly, exactly. If if they're if people know that it's confidential, they will worry less about the legal stuff. Of, will I get charged if I say this or that? Or right. Yeah. You know, will I get right. reported? So if do you have a call to action for our listeners? Is there something you want listeners to, you know, do you want them to put a bumper sticker on their car about restorative justice or call, so, the, call their senator and, and that's representative? A, <laughs> that's a great point. I'm I'm always a three bucket person. Uh, I, I always am. So I, uh, I'm always thinking, what are my three? It's a great question, Robin. Thank you for asking it. Um, one, I'll start with the one that uh, makes, you know, we are, we did get some seed funding from one funder about a little over two years ago to really get us moving in this direction. Um, but we have not, you know, we are just starting to put out grants for this and asking mainly philanthropic donors to support this effort. Um, so we expect that to happen. And we don't, we're, we're not waiting for that to happen to launch this, obviously. So, but we are in, in a way, this is almost an act of faith on the organization, which we act on a lot of faith here. We start a lot of things hoping that it will work out. I can give you lots of examples. Um, and they usually do work out. Uh, so that's what we're, we are looking to, to, to really sustain this work and we need funding to do that as an organization that is supported primarily through donations. Secondly, I would say, uh, yes, I mean, we are going to be uh, pushing a, a bill. It's it's a very it's not a controversial bill. It's like I said, an evidence code change. So if folks want to be supportive in, in whatever community they're in, even if, uh, you know, lesser to your point, even if they're in Bartow County and, and this they don't see, uh, you know, restorative justice landing down the street next week. They say, but I want to encourage this. I want it to land next year. Then uh, one of the things they can do is to is to call their their legislators and say, I hear there's a bill. We were just we were shopping legislators right now. We've been talking to a number of legislators uh, about this and have some there's some appetite to do it. We're not, uh, you know, we think it will happen. Um, but third, I would say uh, is really 
uh, we want people to be aware of this as an option in their community. And, and what I mean by that, it, it can go lots of ways. I mean, if people know that there's another way of handling conflict, another way of handling a crime, and they can ask their elected prosecutors, say, what do you, you know, whether they're the victim or not, or their cousin or their friend or the person they go to church with is a victim, they can say, hey, are you all looking at a restorative option here? Or do we have a restorative option here? Or Mr. or Ms. Prosecutor, have you considered that as an option? Or, or we want that as, as an option in our community. So, so creating that demand, we believe, is one way that we will start on the long term to really move the system in a different direction. Um, so that's that's three, and I guess in my three A, and I'll give it pass it to Rami. It would be become a volunteer. I mean, sign on the volunteer. We we are still going to be having, uh, even though we've already queued up a number of folks, we're going to have more volunteer training uh, starting next year. So, yeah, I would agree. I would just say volunteering, and then folks can check out volunteer opportunities on our website, ggp.org slash restorative justice. And I would encourage people to, if they do want to do restorative justice, or people say they do restorative justice, to take our trainings and start to volunteer with us and receive coaching, because a lot of people think of restorative justice in different ways, and they start using the term, and then it becomes more difficult to correct people's <laughs> idea of what it is. So if you do want to know how to facilitate a process, uh, please go to our website and see what opportunities are available. Sounds good. Great. Well, we're, we're um, at that point in our show where we ask our guest a final question. We ask our guests the same final question every time. And that is, what is what is your definition of justice? How do you define it? And what is your notion of justice? And who wants to go first? Well, well, I've already Doug? answered before. As a, I know as you've a, answered it. I've answered, but I, you know, I, I, I'll just say it again. Uh, to quote, uh, you know, we are our office is right behind the the grave of Dr. Martin Luther King. We're on the same block as a historic Ebenezer Church, same block as the King Center, in the same neighborhood where the civil rights movement started, and and where Dr. King and many others lived and went to church. And I love his quote about justice, and he says, "Justice is love correcting that." which revolts against love. It's a, it's a beautiful quote. I think about it a lot because it's pretty heavy. And I'll stop there and let's see what Rami has to say as, as our non-lawyer on the call. Uh, uh, oh, um, I would say meeting the needs of, of those who've been harmed, if there is harm that has occurred, um, and equity and inclusion wherever, whatever that may look like in different contexts. Yeah, nice. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great to talk to y'all when you have, you can literally say justice is your middle name, the Georgia <laughs> Justice Project. That's, that's, we would say that's good bona fides right there. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Doug and, and Rami. And again, for our listeners, just to remind you, we've been talking with Doug Amar, the executive director of the Georgia Justice Project and Rami El Garib restorative justice program manager. Uh, as Rami said, you can may, lo may learn more about the Georgia Justice Project and the restorative justice program at their website at ggp.org. And you can also follow GJP on Facebook and Twitter. So follow them and, and learn more. Thank you, guys. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Robin. Thank, Thank you, you, Lester. It's an honor. All right, Lester, now's the time where we share a little piece of news, law-related news uh, with our listeners that, that for whatever reason caught our eye or sparked our interest or um, made us raise an eyebrow. So what do you have today? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping into the Wayback Machine today and going back to, to September of 2018. Because even though I subscribe to the New York Times, I don't always read it. You know, people ask, do you read the newspaper? Sometimes you subscribe. But uh, I ran across this. I'm not even sure how I ran across it. But it's a uh, uh, September 6, 2018 uh, article. It's an opinion piece for the New York Times. It's written by a law professor, Professor Ronald J. Uh, Krasinski, who is at the University of Alabama. And it's about the time that Jeff Sessions uh, resigned as uh, uh, former President Trump's attorney general. And uh, 
uh, in Bob Woodward's book about that, President Trump had called Sessions a, quote, dumb Southerner, an idiot, uh, idiot and said that uh, he couldn't even qualify as a uh, a, a small a small town country lawyer uh, in that. And so the piece is entitled In Defense of Country Lawyers. And it goes on to uh, make the point that uh, President Trump, or as the New York Times always calls everyone Mr. Trump, you know, they have the, the style that they do that, is not alone in holding a myopic credentialist view when it comes to a person's legal acumen. It's no coincidence that every member of today's Supreme Court is an Ivy League graduate, uh, uh, with the exception of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who attended uh, Harvard and then finished at Columbia. But he goes on and he starts talking about uh, the things you learn as a country lawyer. And, uh, you know, he says, well, what's more, te- more, what's more, there's something telling in Mr. Trump's steer- sneering contempt for Southern lawyers in particular. It intersects with a general contempt for the South as an intellectually backward region and for a stereo- for the stereotype of the country lawyer as a backward, benighted legal mind. But, he goes on to say that uh, the stereotype does not does contain certain truth in that many people who attended law school in the South practice uh, and practice there experience the law in different ways from, say, lawyers in New York or Boston. Of course, the South produces its share of corporate lawyers, but the region's history of racial discrimination and entrenched poverty requires legal practitioners who can balance a deft understanding of the law with a deep appreciation for the way everyday people interact with it. Shouldn't Mm -hmm. we want people like that running our legal system as well? And uh, I think this sort of hit me because we're in the midst of the uh, uh, U.S. uh, uh, Supreme Court hearing cases. They heard a case just this week where uh, some egghead legal scholar is arguing that uh, uh, the, the courts in states should not be able to review legislative enactments that relate to redistricting, which is something that I think uh, any small town lawyer would have never thought putting on a con law exam because they would have gotten an F on the paper. And so we don't have a lot of people in high legal office uh, anymore who, uh, in my opinion, uh, understand how the law interacts with people in their everyday affairs, and I thought this was uh, was uh, was a, a pretty good uh, piece that spoke to that, and I thought it spoke to it at a time when uh, the Supreme Court is in session and hearing a lot of theoretical arguments uh, without a lot of regard to how those affect people in their their everyday walk of life. Totally agree. And and I think it goes back to one of my pet peeves. We've talked about it before where judges and now obviously the Supreme Court fits this has no experience as a trial lawyer. Um, back off being a trial. You know, I used to say, have you struck a jury being my standard? But forget that. I mean, have you ever sat across the table from a real live person who needed your help? Um, that's a problem, in my opinion, where you have the, you called them eggheads i think the these legal scholars that that espouse esoterical legal uh knowledge but it's not how it really works well i think i think there's a feeling in legal academia and i think i brought this up with some of our uh academic guests you know from time to time but there's i think there's a feeling that if you're just smart enough and you can go and piece together enough research from different places you can you can write a law review article or a white paper that makes what's a clear <laughs> wrong into a right. And, you know, I thought about that the other day when uh, former President Trump was saying that the U.S. Constitution ought to be suspended uh, in, in order to restore him to office because Twitter had uh, suppressed information about uh, his opponent's son's laptop. Oh and my thought, gosh. You know, that's exactly the kind of thing that some of these so called legal scholars, who are usually very bright people, right? Uh, you know, they're, they're going to be writing a letter about the, you know, the Twitter exception uh, to uh, to suspend the Constitution and install the guy you want into office 
when uh, uh, when uh, when they've suppressed information about your opponent's laptop. You know, I mean, it's it's a, it's 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 a real issue. It, it's laughable. Um, great, great article. My mine has to do with a um, case down in Florida where um, a defense lawyer in a in a case that involved a a bounce check, you know, that that's how serious the case is. It's over a bounce check. Um, but the defense lawyer was late for an in-person case management conference, late to court, arrived 25 minutes late because of traffic. This was in Broward County, Florida. The judge, when the defense attorney got there, this was the defense attorney, the judge struck the defendant's answer and put him in default because she was 25 minutes late because of traffic. Now, the Florida Fourth District Court of Appeals reversed and said, we're not going to do that, um, which I'm glad to hear. But, uh, you know, my reaction as a trial lawyer, you and I are in court all the time. It's what we do. Um, for a judge to put your client in default in a case because traffic was bad and you couldn't be there right on time for a case management um conference is is i would say beyond the pale but it but it also brings up an issue that happened a couple of weeks ago here in georgia in clayton county where a judge in clayton county um had a had a defense attorney who who did not appear and i guess i don't know if moved for a continuance or what but had a stroke over the weekend and could not be at trial on monday was actually in the hospital as i recall he was in the He's hospital and I don't remember what the judge did. I don't know if he, I guess she held him in contempt of court. Um, and he was in the hospital after a stroke. Um, I know that that many cr criminal, it was a criminal case. I know of many criminal defense attorneys are ready to report her to the um, the Judicial Qualifications Committee over this, which I would ho wholeheartedly support and agree. That that kind of what I would call robitis, um, lawyers already have enough stress trying to help their clients. They don't need this added business from, from judges treating them like that. Um, I, I just can't even imagine a judge doing that. And you're in the hospital from a stroke. It's, I, you know, and I think the other thing is, you know, you know, you, you know, one of the basic tenets that you learn in judge school, which applies to the Florida case, maybe not the, maybe not the Georgia case, uh, even, even though, in my opinion, at least as reported, the Georgia case is worse. Uh, but you don't punish the client for the lawyer's sins. So even if the, you, right. you know, in my opinion, even if the lawyer had, you know, uh, 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 you know, blown it off to go to, uh, you know, have a drink and gamble that day, you still don't punish the client right. you know, for that. And uh I, I understand too that judges are under a lot of stress, I, and as you know, Robin, I represent a lot of yes. a lot of judges. Yes, uh, and you, and you served of, on the Judicial Qualifications Committee of Georgia I, too. I, I did, and and fully realized after being a judge's judge that I'd rather be the judge's lawyer than the judge's judge. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I think uh, you know it's 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 easy to forget that, you know, we live in a real world where there are traffic jams and there are health issues and kids have to be picked up at school or dropped off at school. Uh, uh, family emergencies come up. And uh, if, 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 if a lawyer is unable to recognize those, uh, they really don't have a lot of business being on the bench, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, it, lawyers even get ill sometimes and it's n not in their client's best interest for them to be representing them that day. Um, I just I guess, you know, I practice law like you do by the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. And I'd like yeah. to see more of that from the bench sometimes. Yeah. And, and I, I, I actually do. I think um, if you look at lawyers who get in trouble, 
a, a lot are sole practitioners and you know you're a sole practitioner rob and i'm 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 I've either been a sole practitioner or close to a sole practitioner my whole career. But when you don't have other lawyers to sort of bounce things off of, you know, in your office, you know, you sometimes yeah. make bad decisions. And I yeah. think there's a lot of isolation that comes with being on the bench. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, some judges don't, uh, you know, it, it, it causes a little bit of robitis. And I see it, I will say I see it less in... Uh, some rural areas, uh, you, you know, where it's a, a smaller circuit and all the lawyers know all the judges yeah. and, and and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. But that's not that, that's not universally true either. So. Well, well this was a great show. That's it. Today. Well, it was a great show and great to be back with you, Lester. And uh, I want you to share, is... too, how many downloads we've had. You sent me a text. Yeah. about that. We've uh, had three, day. three. 3,477. So we're hoping we'll get 3,500 before the end of the year. I think with this episode, we probably will, hopefully. And, um, and we appreciate our listeners. Uh, we appreciate well. our listeners. Um, let me, I think this may be our last show of, the, of 2022. So let me run down some of our credits. Um, we want to thank our sponsor, the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. You may learn more about the foundation at fairplay.org. Fred Smith is the executive director of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. We also thank our producer, Philip Hoover, and we thank our listeners. You can learn more about Lester at Aiken Tate, that's A-K-I-N-T-A-T-E dot com. That's his website. And you can learn more about me, Robin Fraser Clark, at GA Trial Lawyers dot net. And you Robin's more. much more interesting than I am. I'll t I'll tell you that. Right <laughs> now. About, you make me laugh. I don't know about that, but you may learn more about our podcast at cuincourt.squarespace.com. You get all the episodes there, but you can also get all of our episodes uh, and download every one of them on iTunes, Spotify, anywhere where you get your podcast, and you can also rate our podcast. Um, so this will be our last episode of 2022. So we wish all of our listeners a very Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy New Year. We hope your family is safe and sound over the holidays. And thank you for listening. And we will look forward to seeing you in the new year in 2023. And in 2023, we will see you, see in, you in court. court. Thank you for listening to See You in Court. Brought to you by the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation and the Georgia Institute of Technology. Please subscribe to this podcast and consider writing a review. You may find related documents to this week's episode on our website, cuincourt.podbean.com. Please send any questions, suggestions, or ideas to cuincourtpodcast at gmail.com. We thank Noreen Hassan, Associate Professor and Director of Outreach and Community Engagement of the Georgia Institute of Technology School of Literature, Media, and Communication, and the Georgia Tech students who help bring you this podcast. I'm Fred Smith, Executive Director of the Georgia Civil Justice Foundation. You may learn more about the foundation at fairplay 